recording is uh, entitled Lift Your Hearts by Swami Kriyananda. <clears throat> Lift your hearts up to the Lord. Hallelujah. of the One Light, Weekly Commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. Why tell God anything when he knows everything? Why offer God anything when he has everything? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Jesus Christ teaches as the ideal prayer, one that addresses very human demands to God. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <coughs> Jesus himself says, just before suggesting this prayer, your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Why then, his recommendation that we pray for anything the answer is that we should offer ourselves up in acceptance of his abundance. Don't pester God as though pulling constantly on his sleeve to get his attention. Approach him with the confidence of a child in its parents. And in that spirit then, ask him lovingly but with complete trust as though demanding your birthright and without the slightest doubt in your mind that he wants only your best. For you don't have to persuade him the way a beggar or a stranger might. You are his own child. God knows everything already. He knows what is in your heart. It is you who need to clarify your feelings, that you attune yourself to him in turn more clearly. For only by such clarity will you be able to receive perfectly what he gives you. For the same reason, we need to offer ourselves to him, not because he needs anything from us, except, as Yogananda said, our love to complete his love for us but because by self-giving we expand our awareness from its confinement in the little ego outward to infinity. Those who partake of the nectar remaining after a sacrifice, says the Bhagavad Gita in the fourth chapter, attain to the infinite spirit. That person, however, who makes no sacrifices never truly succeeds in enjoying even the blessings of this material world. How then he could, could he attain happiness in subtler realms? Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. Oh. Good morning, everyone. Good How is everyone today? <laughs> Thank you. Actually, that affirmation is more for us than the rest of you. It's a. Uh, um, First of all, if you don't, uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming today and spending this time uh, this Sunday morning. For those of you who don't know us, my name is Nayaswami Gangamata, 
This is my husband, Nayaswami Daiva, and we just returned, I think it was Saturday morning, thanks to Guru Das, who picked us up at the airport. We were home at 1.35 a.m. Saturday morning. It took us a couple of hours, because uh, India, we've been in India for a month, it's like opposite. So when it's 3 a.m. here, it's 3 p.m. there, you're ready to have tea. And uh, at 2 a.m., Daiva was saying, you know, you 3 o'clock, you should get to bed at some point, <laughs> you know, because we are now in a different time zone. I think it was like 4 a.m. when I finally fell asleep. Uh, we both, we slept in until like 2 p.m. yesterday. Nothing was moving. <laughs> um, and then to yesterday, we tried to stay up as late as possible, which was not hard <laughs> this time again. Um, but as we were traveling back, it takes about two days. We spread our travels back a little bit longer, so it took us more like three days to get back because we stopped over um, in London overnight. But as we were starting to travel back, the reality that we were coming back to our rhythm here was starting to come back. Because what's so wonderful about travel, as we all know, you get to step into another reality, and especially in India. It couldn't be more different, more opposite, more unique, more wonderful um, than that. But we were just chuckling, what's the uh, topic? And then, you know, of course, why tell God anything, you know, when he knows everything already? And then the affirmation acceptance. And then what a perfect affirmation uh, when you're traveling and also when you're in India, of course, and you take on a pilgrimage for whether three weeks or four weeks, you're really offering yourself up to what is the flow that, di that Divine Mother wants to have for you during this period of time. But I found myself after four weeks, you really do change your rhythm. You know, four weeks of not having the usual um, email, the usual regular schedule that you keep to, you get into a different bhav. And as we landed in San Francisco, our whole trip was very smooth till we landed back in the States. It took us almost longer to get home from San Francisco than it did to <laughs> fly overseas. But as we were rechecking our bags for our domestic flight, there was just, they were playing this loud music at the check-in terminal. And I was like, why? I mean, I just couldn't think, you know, and the attendant was trying to help us. And I said, I just can't hear you. And I was getting so grumpy. And I thought, what's the affirmation? Oh yes, acceptance. Okay, accept this reality. But I was really thinking, it really pointed out the difference, one difference between America and India. Sometimes the noise in America is just there. You know, it's there, it bombards you, or it's loud, or whatever. In India, yes, there's a lot of noise, uh, but it somehow tends to recede in the background because it's life going on. Uh, and a good example is we went to the ancient city of Varanasi, um, in India, and we went to visit the temple of Trilanga Swami. There's a story of him in the autobiography of a yogi. He was very good friends with Lahiri Mahashaya. They used to hang out together. Trilanga Swami was known to have lived for 300, about 300 years, and he lived for about half that time in Varanasi. And so it was really special we got to visit his temple. There are stories that Trilanga Swami was floating along Varanasi on the Ganga River. And we did lots of boat rides on the Ganga. And it was really fun to imagine him floating somewhere. Because they still feel like his, his presence, you could still feel it around. He was known to be as, as an incarnation of Shiva. So we went there one morning to meditate. And as we entered, um, you know, it was loud all around. It's just there's always noise going on. But as we sit down to meditate, and I'm trying to go deep, every time someone enters the temple, they ring this bell. And it's not like a little ding, ding, ding. It's like clang, you know. <laughs> and then there's other sacred spots around the temple. And as people go and prostrate themselves and offer themselves, again, another clang is going on. And then you're hearing these background noises. You're hearing honking. One thing that um, happens a lot is you're driving around, there's a lot of honking. Um, and that's a way for drivers and um, other pedestrians and people on bicycles to let each other know that you're coming up on them. It just happens and you tend to not hear it anymore, but you could hear even motorcycles and because it's open and, and it's hot. Um, and you hear people talking and, um, and, but then in the midst of all of this, um, this was really fun. I was thinking of you, Evelyn. There's somebody playing the flute. And, and it was so beautiful because you can just get, 
I started to get lulled away from that. And isn't that just like that, the world? The world lulls us away. You hear this beautiful music, right? You go through a beautiful period in your time, and you forget. Forget about God. You forget about the struggles. And you're like, oh, it's so beautiful. And then all of a sudden, we heard this loud, really loud. It must have been a big cow. We hear, moo, moo, really, really loud. And then you just laugh, because you're just like, yes, thank you. Divine Mother for reminding me, you know. <laughs> yes, you know, it's all happening at the same time. And isn't that true for life? It all happens at the same time. We go up, we go down. We're constantly up and down, up and down. But what yoga is trying to teach us is to go right down the middle. Yoga is the neutralization of those waves of feeling, the up. I like the flute music. I don't like the cow mooing. Up and down, right? And we forget, and this affirmation today is perfect because it reminds us to accept all that comes, not just accepting it, but realizing it's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. Another wonderful trip we did, um, it was funny this morning, we, we, you know, we checked in with each other about service, and Diva said, do you know what you're going to talk about? I just said, India. <laughs> uh, I said, what about you? He said, same. <laughs> so <laughs> we apologize, but we, <laughs> that's kind of what, what's in our consciousness. Um, but in tying it to the topic, um, the last leg of our journey, we had the opportunity to hike up to Babaji's cave. And it was a very special part of the trip. Um, we were up at the foothills of the mountains of the high Himalayas, about 6,000 feet. Not too high, but high enough that, you know, I was out of breath. And one day we began our hike, and it just was so sweet. Again, Divine Mother will give you gifts. You know, as we were about to start our trail, um, the sky was blue. There were pine trees. There were birds. I mean, it reminded me of my many years spending hiking in the Sierras. And I was like, thank you, Divine Mother, for this beautiful gift, because this last leg of the journey was kind of a respite for us. The first three weeks were, uh, we were right in the middle of India, traveling Delhi, Calcutta, Puri, Varanasi, I mentioned, Rishikesh. These are busy, populated, uh, noise going on, just cows everywhere, you know, and things going on. And to, be, to end the journey up in Raniket was a real gift, because it was quiet. Uh, we took over the whole resort, as we shared earlier. So it was just our vibration, big, nice room for meditation and yoga. But as we're starting this hike, it's about an hour or so walk. But we had like three hours to complete it. There were like 40, 50 of us doing the hike, all at different times. Um, and I hadn't worn a backpack all month. I had just used my little purse. So I put on this backpack, and I'm about to start walking, and I go, oh, this backpack is so heavy. Oh, no. How am I going to do this? And I start walking, you know, and then I start going, oh, I wish I had my water bottle, and where's my camera? I should be taking pictures, and should, and should, and all this was going on, and I wasn't accepting, you know, where I was. And it finally dawned on me, you're walking on Babaji's you're walking to Babaji's cave. Where's your mantra? It's like, oh, yes. Om Babaji, Om Babaji. Then I remembered, Om Babaji. And a little while, oh, this is really heavy. Maybe I should stop now. You know, it's just so funny how the mind, you know, it's just like when we do our Hong Sa meditation, right? The mind forgets the mantra, forgets who we are, right? I am spirit. That's our mantra. But then we forget, and we're like, oh, what do we need to buy for dinner? And what about this? Same thing when I was hiking on this trail. Om Babaji, Om Babaji. And somehow I was, the more I chanted Om Babaji, the easier the hike was. The more I thought about myself, the harder it was, honestly. And before I knew it, I was gaining momentum. And because we were with like 40 other pilgrims, they were watching us climb, because then you start to climb elevation. You're really out of breath. And they're all, everyone's cheering each other on. It was just so fun. The other fun thing about this part is that we were all in silence. We had just met um, 30 new pilgrims from India. They were joining us for this leg of the journey. We said we had an introductory opening circle, but then we said, OK, now you're in silence. <laughs> you're in silence all day. So as you're doing the hike, so it was really wonderful because 
we expend so much energy talking. Here I am talking. <laughs> you know, but we're talking. And we've forced us to look at each other in our eyes. Right? Yogananda said the eyes are the windows to the soul. And we could cheer each other on. We could say smile and all of that. So I get up to, up to the area, the first staging area, and I drop my pack. And this is where we were going to wait our turn. We had to do it in three shifts because a cave can only fit about 12 or 14. I had just gone up there. I'm way out of breath. And Daya says, do you want to go into the cave, be in the first group? I said, well, sure. I'm not going to say no to going into the cave. So I put my you know, pack down, and I go running up, just running. Again, it's quite steep uh, to get up there. And she's like, come on, come on. I'm about to close the gate. There's just a gate that she closes to keep the energy. I'm sitting in the back. Well, at this point, the altitude's really catching up with me, and I'm out of breath. And the first 10 minutes, I'm just trying to catch my breath. I'm like, <gasps> I'm trying to accept this, you know. And I'm having a really hard time with this. So finally, you know, I should be thinking of Babaji, the vibrations. And, you know, I'm not wanting to move because it's so still in the cave, right? But then I'm hot. And then I'm cold, and then I'm, and then I'm hot, and then I was like, oh, and then I'm thinking, well, how much longer do I need to be in here? And I'm like, wait a minute. I finally made it to Babaji's cave, and I can't wait to get out of here. I mean, I don't know. So, so just, you know, it's what comes, you know. It's, it was my gift from Babaji to accept, you know, and finally, just like, and we had an hour of meditation in there. We had a really nice chunk of time. So I had a lot going on <laughs> in an hour. You know, and that happens sometimes. You know? And then finally, I was just able to just sit here. And just there will be blessings. As Daiva said in the earlier service, we take one step towards God. And when God takes a 1,000 steps towards us, we forget that. It's one step. Okay? How do we accept? You know, this acceptance seems so big. But we start in the moments. We start and go, OK, Babaji, this is, the, this is the best I can give you right now. Help me out here. It's in those moments, right? Yogananda reminds us, take care of the moments. Don't worry about all those things. God knows what's in our heart. Why tell him anything? We don't need to write a dissertation in the morning when we do our purification service, because he knows what's in our heart. So finally, you know, when I was just starting to relax, then time was up. When didn't you know? So the blessing, though, they opened the gate. And there was all these devotees from India, from around the world, meditating just outside the cave. And I stepped outside, and the sun was shining, pine trees glorious, beautiful day. And I thought, how can I have a bad meditation? <laughs> you know, really, this, this is Babaji's cave also standing outside and looking in the eyes of all of my fellow pilgrims that have made the effort to come up here. Babaji is in each of us. God is in each of us. Yes, it's definitely in the cave. And sometimes we have the opportunity to do that. And sometimes we're blessed with the opportunity to go deep. But the true pilgrimage is inside. I was thinking every Sunday, we come on pilgrimage, don't we? We plan our morning. We grab our, if it's a backpack or a purse, and we grab the things that we're going to take with us to come worship. Every Sunday, we come on pilgrimage. And we offer ourselves um, to Spirit, to Divine Mother. We do that every Sunday. But every moment can be a pilgrimage of the heart. And again, we don't have to worry about what we need to spell out to God. He knows what's in our heart. That's the beauty of it. He knows. Again, all we need to do, the benefit is for us, if we can open ourselves and offer ourselves. And God and Divine Mother and Babaji will come running and bless us with so many gifts. Uh, the, <clears throat> I was trying to think how many. Um, anyway, there are so many stories to pick from our trip from India. It was truly. Um, I would say it was filled with adventure. Because when you go on a trip like that, you can't know what's going to happen. 
And truly, the, uh, the affirmation on acceptance is perfect. But one of my favorite times was um, as we were driving up to Raniket, which was the town uh, near where Babaji's cave is, our bus broke down. And it stopped, and all of a sudden, it was really smoky in the back. And we kept telling our tour guide, it's smoky in the back. And he's just like, keep going. It's really smoky in the back. Keep going. You know, there's maybe smoke filling the bus. <laughs> OK, stop the bus. And sure enough, there really was something wrong with it. We all got off. But it was so wonderful to see how 25 pilgrims just said, what can we do? I know. We can take advantage of this time and take a toilet break. <laughs> so we all just dispersed, you know, and came back. And then by the time we came back, the bus was fixed. We were all very grateful for the break, right? And then we just took off. Well, wouldn't you know, this bus breaks down again, OK? Second time, OK, time to get off the bus. The um, bus driver's assistant, I don't know what he was doing. He, he had a nice outfit on, and then he puts on this jumpsuit, just like he was Superman or something. Puts on this jumpsuit, he runs out, gets under the bus, fixes it in no time. No time. And then we climb back up on the bus. And we had a lovely woman on our trip from Japan. And she said, you know, I was really, really touched. When the bus broke down again, nobody panicked. Everybody just accepted it as a gift from Babaji. I thought, wow, yes, that's exactly what happened. Nobody panicked. Um, everybody thought, OK, here it goes again. What if we, and this happens again, again, because that line goes up and down, right? It happens again. It ha may not happen for a while. It happens again. It will happen. But that affirm our affirmation today is perfect in remembering that everything that comes is for our benefit, for our growth, is a gift to us, wrapped up. You know, it's like uh, the beautiful bow on top of a gift that we have, which is the blessing of having this life together, of sharing uh, this path together, of being together. So um, I think I've probably spoken enough, but um, it is a blessing to be back. We um, really could feel all of your energies. The other thing that you notice when you travel from afar, you're really not away. You know, the, the energy, of course, with Facebook and all this Dwapara Yuga, you know, makes you feel so connected. But energetically, we took you all with us, every shrine that we went to. Um, it wasn't just us doing this. It was us on behalf of everyone here. So we thank you all for holding the light so bright, brightly. So many people. We met devotees from all around India, all around India. It's a huge country from Japan, from other countries. They all wanted to ask how their Ananda family was doing here in Portland and Laura Woods. So anyway, many blessings. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be with you all. A friend of mine, um, in talking about India, we were just discussing some of the differences between the life that we live here and the common experiences that India presents. And uh, at one point, the summary kind of came that uh, in the West, we have organized delusion. In the East, they just have delusion. <laughs> Everything is everywhere. But in the West, we have it all very well organized. But it's still delusion. I thought I'd start for just a moment with the, um, the reading, just a, an excerpt from this beautiful poem, My India by Yogananda. And uh, it feels poignant because, as Gangamada was referring to or, or alluding to, um, life in India is intense, and um, it, it carries with it a, a lot of things that we presume against. We, we have expectations of life that um, don't even get on the radar over there, and yet something else 
is present that Yogananda speaks to. Not where the musk of happiness blows, not in lands where darkness and fears never tread, nor in homes where unceasing smiles reign, nor in heaven, nor prosperous lands would I be born, if once more I must assume a mortal garb. A thousand famines may rack my body, waste my flesh, and leave me prostrate, yet would I be born again in Hindustan. A million thieves of disease may steal my flesh, and clouds of fate send scalding showers of searing sorrow, yet would I prefer in India to reappear. Is this love of mine a blind sentiment, spurning reason's guidance? Far from it. I love India because it was there I first learned to love God and all things beautiful. Thank you. I can see you better when I have my glasses on and I know it blocks my eyes, so I'll take them on and off as we can. You'll hear more if you stay for the satsang after service. You'll hear much more about the journey to India with all its vagaries. Um, I can tell you that it was an extraordinary journey, that it was filled with blessings beyond counting. And just as every other time I've been to India, I've come away realizing that India at its deepest is... Ananda at its best. When Ananda is really alive in the hearts and um, actions and thoughts of Ananda devotees, there is nothing in the deepest parts of India that can exceed the experience and the, and the spiritual magnetism and power that's held here. We went to um, site after site after site, um, shrine after shrine after shrine, places of enormous power where not only great, great saints have lived um, and by their magnetism imbued the soil with upliftment and power, but people across centuries have come in recognition of that and lent their spiritual devotion, their attention. They've lent their magnetism also to those sites. And that would be extraordinary, except it's everywhere. <laughs> There's just no place you turn where you don't run into that kind of an experience. The population density, the amount of detritus of human life um, are staggering. If you haven't been in that kind of environment, it's the, the difference is staggering. And there's this background hum and thrum of just people living their lives. I was, I was talking with an Indian man because 25 years ago I was in India and um, it was so intense. There were 800 million people living there at that time. And it was like you, if you took America's population density and you just put it in India at that same density and then added four people for every one that's here. That was what it was like then. And I thought every morning I'd get up and I'd go out and I'd think, this can't possibly go on another day. And the next morning I'd get up and there it was again. And I'd think, it can't possibly go on. And in that period of time, India was adding to the population above mortality a million people a month. A million people a month. That's a Portland a month being born and needing to be accommodated. And I thought, well, you know, it's going to implode. It has to implode. And when we left, I was certain that, you know, kind of just a bookmark and India just stopped. And we got back. It has added 50% to its population in the time we were gone. It's now 1.2 or 1.3 billion people. And it's still going on just as intense as it ever has. And I looked at the man next to me. I said, you know, nobody stops moving. And he said, I think that's the secret. <laughs> I think that's the secret to how it works. It just never stops. It just, everybody gets up in the morning and does the next thing. And it's intense. It is intense beyond comparison. I, I don't know how to, how to pull off. But there's something that's so 
innocent. You know, people are just doing whatever it takes to get through the day with every ounce of energy they have and attention they have. We got back to the United States, and, and you know, so there's the noise, but it didn't have any, any particular impact on my consciousness. We just adapted to it. It just became a part of, of what was happening. I got back, and there was a guy standing behind me in um, a line in the San Francisco airport, one guy. You know, the density was, was American. I mean, it was just it was space around it. But one guy, and he was on the phone, and he was talking, you know, very important business. And he was talking kind of at the, at the fullness of his, of his authority. And he was just feeling, and I thought, this is, what's the matter with this picture? This is so extraordinarily annoying. And I realized what it was. It was me, but. <laughs> There's always that. But I, but I realized that this is a land of egoic assertion. It wasn't the noise. It was the, the I'm important. This matters and everything else is, is subservient to my presence and my issues. And it wasn't what was happening in India. People were just trying to get through. The, the, the secret in India is everybody accommodates everything. Acceptance and accommodation. People, you know, <laughs> you can be in, a, in an enormous bus bearing down on the street, and there's a cow on the road, and you just move out of the way, you know? And if there's somebody crossing the road, it's just this constant movement. You know, here, if somebody gets in your way, you carry that around all day long, and you're really pissed about what just happened. And there, it's just every single moment is inconvenient in ways that we can't even imagine. <laughs> And people are just moving with it without any sense of it, of it hitting them, connecting. It's not a part of their reality. They're just doing what they're doing. And it it's, it's really would behoove us much to a, a, adopt a lot of that, you know, to let go of the egoic assertion of, of our sense of rightness, our importance, the, that we've got the answer. There are a lot of answers, and a lot of people are playing it out, that we have to do what's ours. You know, there were two things. I came back, and there were two things that were going on that really struck me. Because life didn't stop here or there. Um, one of the things is that somebody said, you know, we should mention, they, ins they encouraged us to mention some political event that's happening out in the world right now. And I thought about it. I meditated deeply on it. And I thought, you know, it's a very important issue. But it's one of many many, many very important issues in the world right now. And it will pass. It will resolve itself. God willing, it will resolve itself in a way that, that furthers wholeness and goodness. But it's there for the people who are involved in it to grow. And it's not broken. It's not a mistake. It doesn't mean we should be blind or ignorant. But, but the message in this room is eternal. The number of things that have come that have been so, so important and absolutely life-changing and need to be addressed and are just gone. Every day there are things that come. And we have to cut beneath the surface of these issues. We have to go to the heart of life where truth and spiritual power and love and blessings and goodness all exist beneath the surface of every activity. And understand how people really grow, understand how life really happens, and tune into that level. And then the other thing that happened is some friends of ours, they are directors of Ananda Center in, in uh, Scotts Valley. Lives are completely offered to serving Ananda, to serving God through Ananda. And they just built a beautiful center, and it's very magnetic. We gave service there a couple of months ago. It's very beautiful. Serves a lot of people, and it's a growing center, but it's a, it was a major stretch. And just in the last month or so, while we've been gone, um, the woman has, has found that she has um, a recurrence of cancer and is pervasive. And in the midst of them trying to hold the center and serve at the school and do all these other things, their whole world has just collapsed around them. And I thought, you know, this is, a, this is, this is tragic, except 
And I would love to solve it. You know, I'd love to solve the political issue. I would love to solve their issue. I'd love to solve it all. You know, in my heart of hearts, and every one of us feels this, we'd love to be able to just push a button and make it all different. And again, I said it in the first service. You know, in the early days of Ananda, I went, I was, I went into the bathroom and I was, I just saw a man who'd been with Ananda for quite a while. He was a friend as well. But I just said, you know, if God had his way, and the man just looked at me like I was a lunatic. He said, whose way do you think this is? <laughs> These things are God's way. You know, every single one of us, if you went out right now, and the saint said this, but it's so true, and you put every bit of karma in the entire universe on a big table, it have to be a really big table, you put it all on a big table, and you said, you, every person can go and pick anything off of that table that they want. You know what? We'd all just pick exactly what we have. We'd all just pick exactly what we have because guess what? We picked this. One saint said, I look around me and all I see are my own desires. Because these are the things that we have to learn. We came for exactly these moments. We came, believe it or not, for this election. We came for the issues that are on the table in front of us. And underneath them, if we go deep, we discover the presence of God. We discover the eternal, living, joyful presence in the midst of everything. You know, compartmentalizing life, compartmentalizing um, uh, delusion, we're good at it over here. And I, I suppose it's a mixed blessing. I suppose there's good things in it. But in everything, the same light of God shines. And when we stop compartmentalizing, when we stop saying, this is good, this is bad, I want it this way, and then I can be happy, when we stop doing that, start just embracing what's there. One of the things that's beautiful about these friends down in, in Scotts Valley, for all of their struggle, they're taking every single moment and every single thing, and they're finding the presence of God right in the midst of it. There is so much beauty in receiving what God gives us instead of just pushing it away and defining it as good or bad, in stepping into it and opening ourselves and finding the eternal blessings, the poem of Master that we just read, the poem of Yogananda. He talks about, you know, where God can be found, no matter what's happening on the surface, there would I be. Let's carry those blessings. Let's carry those thoughts. Let's carry that into our days. Let's accept and embrace whatever life gives us, going deeper and deeper into it, in devotion, in friendship, in receptivity, in joy. Let's, let's make every day a pilgrimage. Let's make every moment sacred together. We'll have music. Living water.